Just as the United States was the first nation to reach the moon in the 20th century, so too will we be the first nation to return astronauts to the moon in the 21st century. And I'm here on the President's behalf to tell the men and women of the Marshall Space Flight Center and the American people that at the direction of the President of the United States, it is the stated policy of this administration and the United States of America to return American astronauts to the moon within the next five years. Welcome to your online coffee break, where we discuss bite-sized topics that inspire, educate, and entertain. Here's your host, a software innovator, award-winning marketer, and astronomy and space buff, Chuck Fields. Hello, thanks for joining me today for your online coffee break. Well, folks, the mandate has been set. NASA intends to send Americans back to the moon within the next five years by 2024. Vice President Mike Pence announced this just last week at the National Space Council meeting in Huntsville, Alabama. Now, just a couple weeks before that, NASA hosted their Moon to Mars event at facilities throughout America. I was fortunate to attend this event at the NASA Glenn Research Facility in Cleveland, Ohio. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to take you with me on a journey as we go behind the scenes at NASA Glenn, talk to some of the people there, and learn about some of the technologies they're developing to send Americans back to the moon. Online Coffee Break. Now, many of us have heard of Kennedy Space Center in Florida, but again, NASA has facilities all across America that are integral to their mission. Now, this is my first time at NASA Glenn in Cleveland, Ohio. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about that incredible facility. First off, the NASA Glenn Research Center was originally established in 1941, when it was known back then as the Aircraft Engine Research Laboratory. It quickly became a world-class aircraft engine research laboratory and then evolved in the 1950s to research new types of propulsion. In the 1960s, the center began helping with the space program with Project Mercury and helped train astronauts, including Ohio's own John Glenn. Since then, it's evolved into a state-of-the-art facility for researching and developing innovative technologies for both aeronautics and space exploration. Well, this was my first time attending NASA Glenn, and I have to say for the Moon to Mars event, I was very impressed. We had many special treats awaiting us, but one of the first things that uh, really caught my eye was this wonderful sample from a lunar rock from Apollo 15. Here's John Oldham, their exhibit specialist, telling us a little bit more about that. Okay, John, here we are at uh, Moon to Mars program. You've got this wonderful astronaut suit behind us from Apollo 15 and a lunar sample over there. Tell us about the Apollo 15 lunar sample we got. So the Apollo 15 lunar sample, its its name is 15058.192. It is a 3.7 billion year old piece of lunar basalt. So it was picked up on the Apollo 15 mission, 1970, uh, 71, correct, 71, and um, brought back to Earth. Uh, It has been studied extensively, and we're still learning from lunar rock, especially 15058. It's out in the world being studied in small pieces, but we have a fairly large sample here. Well, let's walk over to it. Now, what's fascinating to me is is today, obviously, we're at the Moon to Mars um, program. What do you foresee as just going to happen for the next uh, phase of moon exploration by NASA? So it's it's um, quickly becoming a, a very um, aggressive um, program to, to get back in exploration further than low Earth orbit, mm-hmm. which is awesome. Mm-hmm. And uh, that will require steps, processes, yes. new equipment, uh, untested and untried processes that, that we're all working on. And uh, part of that uh, will include getting back to the moon in a sustainable way, which is one of the big mandates we have now at NASA. So here at NASA Glenn, we are contributing to that, um, that effort in, in, a, in a fairly decent way with uh, a, a system to get us at the moon and be able to stay on site at the moon um, for a length of time, mm-hmm. which eventually will allow us to go back and forth to the surface, back up to a, a local um, a local station, if you will, right. mm-hmm. to, and then be able to get back and forth to Earth. A lot of the things that we're going to need to do way out in deep space, we'll be able to test in fairly close space. The moon is by no means, you know, next door. Exactly. <laughs> but um, but a, a great place for us to test some of the new equipment, hardware, and processes, materials that, that we're working on here at Glenn. 
right around the corner from John in the Apollo 15 lunar sample was this amazing VR experience. They had all kinds of headsets and we could put them on and experience what it was like to float around the International Space Station or even walk on the moon. Now, these were provided by what's called NASA's Graphics and Visualization Lab. They actually developed VR to help scientists visualize data. Here's Herb Schilling, a computer scientist for NASA, telling us a little bit more about what they do. Now, what's really cool, uh, right now we have a lot of VR going around. Can you tell me more about just the different VR uh, that's being offered here today at NASA? Going? So a lot of what we do in our team these days related to VR and AR are uh, ways of explaining what NASA does to the public and key stakeholders and things like that. So we take people to wind tunnels, we show people NASA concept vehicles, we take them to moons of Saturn, things like that. Um, in an interesting, engaging way, you know, like through VR, and, and hopefully we make it so that you can even interact with it sometimes, like that one with the block. So it's it was fascinating. Yeah, I got to uh, play with blocks and fly around the International Space Station, which I thought was great. So again, Herb, you guys are doing a very great job here. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for coming. Well, of course, being a computer programmer myself, I was very impressed, and I wanted to find out more. And they actually had uh, this really awesome programmer, Calvin Robinson, who was there. And I asked him a little bit more about what it is that drew him to this field for working as a programmer for NASA. Here he is explaining that. Well, you mentioned earlier that it's more of the data visualization side of it. So what kind of drew you to that side, and what are you doing in that field? Yeah, so I think it was just mostly uh, my skill sets. Um, at the time, I had an opportunity to learn Python, and I just got really in the programming language. And uh, I found that Python normally works really well for putting together sort of small simulations, small frameworks for our researchers. And oftentimes the researchers I support, they're also asking for a little bit of data analysis as well. Fascinating. What are you most looking forward to for the future of space exploration here at NASA? Oh man, uh, I, th I think definitely going to Mars, um, just extending the capabilities that we have right now to return to the moon, and then what we can continue to do so eventually we can actually reach Mars. It's really exciting. You know, I was thinking about that. When they have a base on Mars, they're going to need software developers, and of course I would volunteer for that, but you're probably way ahead of me on that. So if you got the opportunity, will you go to Mars? Mm, I don't think so. I think I could probably do, <laughs> do a lot more to help out by staying down here. That means there's room for me. Yay. <laughs> thank you for your time. Oh, not a problem. Thank you. One of the directives for getting back to the moon is establishing a permanent human presence. Now, instead of sending resupply missions, uh, which would be cost prohibitive after a while, we need to take advantage of the resources we have there. I'm going to show how old I am here, but there used to be a game that I loved called Oregon Trail. It was basically, uh, you had a covered wagon, it was old Wild West, and you were traveling across America, and you had to make sure you took enough supplies with you to make your journey successful. Well, when we go to the moon and we go to Mars, sending all the materials we need to survive um, over a long period of time would just be cost prohibitive after a while. So it would really save some time, save some money if we can take advantage of the resources we find there. Well, one key area within NASA is called ISRU, or the In Situ Research Utilization. And we were fortunate to talk a little bit more about that. As a matter of fact, we uh, met research engineer Julie Kleinhens in the Slope Lab. Here she is talking about more about what they do. So it's a really exciting uh, uh, idea to, to live off the land. Um, obviously, the, the pioneers didn't take everything with them. They, they used what, they, what was there. Um, so we use both the Slope Lab and our different facilities to do that. The simulants we use, obviously the big problem is we only have so much lunar soil returned. Um, so you can't use them for quantities of scale like this. And we're talking about making something like uh, 40 metric tons of propellant when we're talking about Mars. And we're talking about something like 10 metric tons of oxygen if we're talking about the moon. So these aren't small quantities that we're talking about to support humans. So you have to talk about big scale excavators and testing with large scale soil. Uh, so we have different simulants that simulate things like the, the different chemical composition of the soil, as well as the different properties. So while these things are great for mobility simulants, they're not necessarily good for reacting with, with ISRU purposes. What a travel to the moon and to Mars, power is a key component for human space exploration. Fortunately, NASA Glenn is on the cutting edge for research into advanced power systems. Uh, we were fortunate to get a very up-close look about the alternative power um, systems that they were developing. Here's Wayne Wong, the acting branch chief for thermal energy conversion, talking a little bit more about what they do. Dynamic power, specifically Stirling engines, are very efficient 
And we actually have stored on the engine, and the chart says you know, down to 55 watts, up to 6 kilowatts, and even higher uh, is certainly possible. But internally here at um, in our branch, we're actually working on even lower power systems, down to about 1 watt. And um, with these power systems, uh, when we talk about systems that are below 1 kilowatts, ideally, uh, that's suited for radio-wide-still power systems. For systems that require more than 1 kilowatt, uh, that's kilopower, which is ideally suited for 1 to 10 kilowatts. Now I was really fascinated by their demonstration of what's called a Stirling engine. This is a heat engine that operates by compression and expansion of air. So it basically converts heat to power in a closed system. Now another power source is of course nuclear. Here's research associate Max Chaikin telling us a little bit more about that. The only other option for power in space is to use nuclear power due to the mass limitations of launching. You don't want to launch up, you know, hundreds of, of tons of fossil fuels to then run a, a gas turbine on the moon or a coal-powered plant on the moon. So what you have is either solar or nuclear for the most part. Um, so what we do in this branch is we design power systems that would then interface with a nuclear energy source uh, to produce electrical power, to produce heat power that you could use for various applications. Um, as Moine mentions, there's two different types of, of nuclear power. There's radioisotopes. Uh, which you'll hear a little bit more about later. Uh, and then the, the project that I'm working on is actually a fission nuclear reactor. It's a miniature version of those same commercial power plants that uh, create power. There's actually two up here in northern Ohio uh, producing power as we speak. Um, this would be a kind of miniature baby version of those commercial nuclear reactors. So it, it involves uranium, it involves the fission chain reaction, um, and all the different physics that goes behind that. And there's a very cool um, kind of system benefits that you get from doing that. Another key component in human space exploration is propulsion. How do you get there? Now, we've used chemical rockets for years, but there's also been some advanced, amazing research and demonstrations of alternative propulsion, such as electric propulsion. Now, we were fortunate to go on a tour with Deborah Waters, Space Simulation Facility Manager for the NASA Glenn Center. Here, Deborah explains the benefits of electric propulsion. So, it's, a, it's just it's a slower technology. If you're going to go to an asteroid and you've got years, okay, you'll go to an asteroid very efficiently. So this is 10 times more efficient than Kenpop. So that's what makes it attractive. You put less, you have to put less uh, propellant up in air with you, up, up in orbit with you. So just from that aspect, it's a little cheaper. And it's, you know, and it's pretty reliable once you get it up there. You know, it, it, it will last you 15 years. So that's the, that's the good part of electric propulsion. Now, making excellent strides in research and development comes not only from excellent team members, but also leadership. And NASA Glenn is no exception. Dr. Janet L. Cavandi is the center's director and a leader in space exploration. She's a veteran of three space flights and a recipient of a presidential rank award, two NASA Outstanding Leadership Medals, two Exceptional Service Medals, and three NASA Spaceflight Medals. Here's Dr. Cavandi speaking about how to ensure our long-term presence on the moon and the technologies we're using to get there. Can we, can we extract that water and make it usable? Can we extract materials from the surface of, you know, when we get to Mars and we'll want to uh, take materials from the surface of Mars, from the atmosphere of Mars, and make fuel from that? We'll be able to make habitats from that, you know. Um, so, and we'll be able to grow food and, and generate our own, um, you know, water and air and all those kinds of things that we need to do because you can't ship everything back and forth. You'll have to be able to make some of it yourself while you're there. So learning how to do, you know, 3D printing and things like that of uh, existing materials, all those things that, that we'll try to do, make sure that the equipment can last for long periods of time in those kind of dusty environments. Uh, and and will computers work with radiation over long periods of time? You know, so those those kinds types of things we can check out in the lunar vicinity first before we go on. Another exceptional leader at NASA Glenn is Brian Smith, the director of space flight systems. Brian has supported design and test activities for the International Space Station's power system, and has also served as a launch vehicle mission manager. Brian has received numerous NASA awards, including NASA's Significant Achievement Medal and the prestigious Presidential Rank Award for Meritorious Executives. Here's Brian speaking about the plan to go back to the moon and on Mars. I've worked for NASA 30 years, 
and I can now, I mean, I can see it and I can feel it right now. There's a confluence that wasn't here in the past. Uh, my daughter, a few years ago, saw a NASA patch and said, can I use that? And I said, well, yeah, they've always been around the house. She said, yeah, they have, but NASA's cool now. I'm like, now? What happened the last 30 years, right? And so, um, but I think what I was picking up on is there is this confluence. The confluence comes from, you know, national policy. It comes from international policy. It comes from a, a couple cool billionaires that, you know, put a little, you know, a little star factor in it at the same time. So there's a number of things. People have made money in space, made billions in space. Um, we're very reliant on it everywhere we, everywhere we look. So you take that and you add a few more things to it. You see the progression that we've had with the ISS, the success we've had with that. To be able to fly Americans from American soil. I mean, we have re re relied on the Russians quite a bit to get our astronauts uh, into space. So there is a confluence now. And the administration has given that to us in a budgetary policy and in financial policy. And I, I think it's it, I think it's a little it's special right now. So uh, that's what I see, and I think we're going to get some real successes from this in the future. Well, I agree with Brian definitely. Space is cool again, for sure. It's going to be incredible to see what happens over the next five years as we strive to meet this incredible goal of getting Americans back to the surface of the moon. I want to thank everyone at NASA Glenn for inviting us and hosting us for their Moon to Mars event. I also want to thank NASA for just all their team members um, across the nation working so hard to do the incredible goals that they do and accomplish the amazing dreams that they do. If you'd like to learn more about the Moon to Mars program, just go to nasa.gov forward slash moon to Mars. I'd like to thank you for joining us today. If you'd like to comment on today's topic, just go to our website, onlinecoffeebreak.com, or follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Online Coffee Break. We'd also love it if you'd subscribe to our series uh, on Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast application, or of course, follow us on YouTube. And if you have a fellow space enthusiast that you could think could benefit from this uh, discussion today, just share this episode with them. Thanks again for joining us today. We'll see you next time. God bless.